Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DOD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiag.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. Uh, when you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to download presentation. Second, all participants are, mu are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can use that to chat with each other, and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please click the ellipse icon with the three dots labeled more panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenters. Uh, if you have a technical issue during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Uh, with that said, I would like to introduce uh, today's uh, webinar presenters. Uh, Dr. Mark Gallagher is a professor of practice for operations research at the Office of the Secretary of Defense Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, supporting the U.S. Department of Defense Analysis Working Group on Enhancing Modeling and Simulation. He spearheaded the creation of the weapons ass assignment model for nuclear forces and beam to investigate joint campaign strategies and force structures. He received the, Bar the Barchi and Risk Prizes and the Fellow of Society and Thomas Awards for Moors. Dr. Gallagher holds a BS degree in operations research and computer science from the US Air Force Academy and an MS and PhD in operations research from the Air, Fo Air Force Institute of Technology. Dr. Steven Surgeon is a technical lead on the beam project at Lindquist Corporation where he developed a unique algorithmic approach to simulation and executed and analyzed several studies using B. Prior to his current position, he served on active duty as an analyst in the U.S. Air Force. Dr. Sturgeon holds a Ph.D. in mathematics from the University of Kentucky. I'd like to thank our presenters, and with that said, we can get started with today's presentation. Thank you. Um, there we are. So today we're gonna to talk to you about BEAM. So it's the Bilateral Enterprise Analysis Model, and I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk to you through this. Um, we're gonna cover, here's our outline, we'll do overview. Uh, we've learned from talking to lots of people, we're gonna jump quickly into a demonstration, then we're gonna talk about applications, and later we'll actually talk to you about how we're actually calculating all these numbers. So what is BEAM? 
So we're calling it an enterprise level. So in the pyramid of models, which I'll show you later, um, it's actually less resolution than a campaign model. And we did that because we could get it straight. Hey, Mark, the yes. slides aren't sharing. They're coming up. There it is now. So do you see the slides now? Yeah, they're showing. They're not in presentation mode, but we're seeing the PowerPoint. Sorry, okay. Um, yeah, we can see you're on slide three right now. So here we are. And what yeah, is Beam? There we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for correcting me there. So Beam is a enterprise level, so it's got less resolution than a campaign model. What we find is it's going to be very easy to get at military strategies. Here's I'm talking about the objectives, the ends, ways, and means of actually what we're forces are doing. So we haven't been able to search that with an analytical tool before. Now we can do that. It also gets into force structure. We can put in future systems in there. And you talk about the access of different bases and infrastructure, particularly like different countries participate or not. Right? So it's a fast training model that runs on a laptop. So we've simplified a lot. And the government's goal is to make this a community tool. So there's no charge for it. Although within the government, there is funding. And so far, the Air Force and Space Force have been funding that. NATO is adopting this in their next generation MS uh, uh, tool. And then uh, we actually are improving the Moving in with demonstrations of cases, and we'll show you some of those as we go through. So here's a demonstration that we've recorded for Beam. So I'm going to kick off the demonstration. Which Hello, my name is Steven Search, and I'm going to demo the Beam simulation software here. So we're going to look at a scenario here. This is an unclass example scenario that we built for testing purposes. So the scenario features a amphibious joint invasion from Cuba into southern Florida with an imaginary force structure built out across the AOR. So you see we're working at a regional representation of the conflict, so large regions as opposed to uh, tracking lat latitude and longitude. The uh, force forces themselves are aggregated at the level of uh, squadron and battalion, and adding force structure is as easy as picking a, a region. So here we'll pick Cuba East 1, add an asset. Here's a list of possible assets. I'll add an artillery asset by just hitting the plus button. So this is going to put in an artillery battalion. I can change the number uh, of battalions that are there, the time delay before the battalions get there, and the initial ISR picture. Uh, the ISR will continue to update throughout the scenario based on your collection activities uh, during the conflict. Okay, so that's how easy it is to change force structure. I'm going to switch over to strategy now. Uh, so we use a phase representation of strategy. So when there's a significant change in the uh, strategy of the enemy, uh, that moves to another phase. So if you have certain objectives you need to complete before others, then you, you break those out by phase. So I'll pick phase one here. Uh, we do strategy for both blue and red, as long as force structure for both. So both sides are completed, or we behave identical. Um, so blue and red is a completely two-sided model. Uh, we track both actual and perceived strategies, so if there's, if you believe the enemy is going to do something but you're slightly off, you can capture those kind of effects. Okay, well here we see a number of ends. Ends are the primary, the objectives that you're after. Some of those are primary, some of those are secondary, but that guides your allocation algorithm and your assessment of whether you're ready to move to the next phase. Some of these ends are going to have ways associated with them that says this is particularly how I want to execute that end. So, for instance, you may want to hit, hit things with airstrikes and missiles, but you don't want to start a full off ground and ground war. Uh, then you might want to restrict the options with ways. Otherwise, Beam will use whatever options it thinks are available. Uh, means are a further restriction on ways. Maybe you want to restrict just to fifth gen aircraft or something of that sort. And risks allow you to hold back certain portions of the force. So maybe you keep a carrier back until you reach uh, a certain level of of proficiency in your other objectives, taking down anti-ship cruise missiles and that kind of thing, and then you allow the carrier to move forward. So that's how you represent strategy. Um, so it's a very sim simple view of, of strategy and force structure allows you to uh, set up a scenario. Okay, so moving back to the dashboard here, I'm gonna switch over to a study. So a study is a wrapper around a scenario. 
I'm going to pick the scenario we were just working with. Uh, so what this is going to allow us to do is to kind of create an exploration around that base scenario. Okay, so after the scenario is loaded, we'll push the load button here. And this is going to drop us in on a parametric exploration page. So this is a place where we can vary force structure and strategy objects uh, around the baseline to try to see what, what the impact are of di different factors. So I'll pull up uh, Cuba East. There's the artillery we added. Uh, we said there were two, but maybe there's more. So I'll go up by steps of two until I get to six. So I'll run it with two, four, and six. Uh, you can do the same thing down here with strategy. So you had a strategy objective here. It was weighted at a weight of 10. Uh, we could put it to zero, which is effectively turning off that objective. So there's something that was going to be targeted. Now it won't be targeted. Uh, and so run the scenario with and without that and do that in combination with these changes up here. And you can see the actual set of runs right here and the levels that we're going to run each of the objects at. Uh, you can actually import it from this point. So it's maybe you didn't want a full factorial representation. You want to do something a little bit smaller. Uh, so we can, uh, or a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit smaller than a full factorial. So we can load a DOE here. So this is one, we've got 60 columns. We're varying everything from enemy forces, or, uh, the uh, allies, readiness, constellations, uh, at placement, basing, uh, just actual increases in the amount of forces we have. And we're gonna vary, we're gonna run 30 replications of the scenario at different levels of all these things right here. So that, you load that in. Uh, and now when I hit run start simulation, this will kick off a run running all those different versions of the scenario and dump a whole lot of data that I can analyze afterwards. So I want to illustrate some of that data real fast here. So the uh, this is a metastats kind of view. So here's each of our excursions and for each of those we've got some high level things like casualties, time to complete, uh, by phase for the enemy, how many, or by the phase for the enemy, by the phases for the blue side. We've got casualties broke out by red, blue, and green, um, major system losses. So all of that stuff is kind of captured at the high level here. Uh, in addition to that, though, you may want to dig in a little deeper. Uh, there's a number of files that are dropped there in CSV format, so they can easily be imported into Jump uh, or explored in Excel uh, or whatever your favorite tool is. Uh, we did some analysis for this particular run using R. Uh, where we were varying a whole lot of different options that Blue had to stop this amphibious invasion. And we were able to do some regression, partition trees with that, and we were able to determine what are kind of our, our best options out of the list of possible things we could do within the conflict. Uh, and so able to draw some decision level uh, information out of that. So that's what BEAM is. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at beam at lindquest.com. Thank you. Hello, my name is Steven. Okay, so um, this is Steven Sturgeon. I'm going to take over for the next few slides as we go through here and um, talk about some Beam applications. Uh, so Beam is really is, is very low resolution. So we're not talking about you know, very, the details, the physics, uh, uh, the networks uh, of their work might be dealing with a lot of other models where they're very detailed. We're looking at really large trade spaces. Okay, so things like basing, allies, readiness, and positioning, constellations, uh, munitions levels, those really high level items are what, what we're trying to get at. Um, one of the advantages here is we've got uh, opponent adaption going on. So uh, for instance, we had a study where we were studying adding shelters, uh, added the shelters, didn't make any difference in the campaign. Uh, it made a lot of difference if you were trying to bomb the aircraft on the ground, but they didn't do that. They just switched and took out the tanker fleet. And so that kind of adaption uh, is something that you can consider at this uh, at this level. Um, one thing we do get at is what are the mission areas where improvement significantly alters campaign success? So some factors that will come up is we're, we're spending a lot of time maybe doing a lot of analysis of a particular type of mission. Um, but that mission area isn't really what matters. What really matters is this other thing. We just don't have enough munitions in that area. And so getting those kind of insights and narrowing down on what's the what's the thing that matters for the campaign rather than the effectiveness within a particular mission is, is where BEAM fits really well. Uh, one thing we can do is explore uh, capability improvements. So 
kind of smeeing stuff up, kind of looking at into the future of, okay, we're get, we get this new system, but how much better does it have to be before I can, before it really makes a difference? So if I'm, I can be more survivable, if I do this thing, I can, if I buy this system, I'm more effective, um, but how much of an improvement do I have to get before I'm going to see a, a difference in the campaign? And then obviously we've highlighted before uh, military strategies. So what if you approach the conflict differently? Uh, how can how can that make an impact in the scenario? Next slide. Okay. All right. So this we're going to go through an example right now of an unclass scenario that's similar to a classified scenario that we did. Uh, again, it's using that same scenario that you saw in the demo. Uh, so just to give scale of what's going on here, uh, we've got 55 regions to be broken it into 475 air squadrons, 467 battalions, 146 ships, 720 satellites. So there's a it, it's a it's a big joint thing. It's not a not talking about a particular domain or or really small things. And I do I, I left it off here. Uh, we do have some some cyber stuff. Uh, that's mostly notional right now um, as we're kind of waiting for where to get the um, more, more detailed data on that domain. But very large uh, campaign, Cuba's uh, invading Florida. Next slide. Okay, so this is just uh, how we map some big things. So um, looking at cap changes in capabilities, indications and warnings and posture and how changes in these is big ideas can, can be mapped down and so we, we broke those big operational vectors into these components um, the components then we mapped to individual things within beam and so just you don't need to deal with the excel there um, when pulling out what are some of the things we're varying uh, your targetability at the beginning of the campaign your uh, effectiveness of your forces so uh, what, if, what if your forces just have an advantage and whether it's training or something you know they're they're a little bit better or they're worse or you know varying that around uh our, our number of constellations that we have available so number of uh space assets we have uh rebasing of forces turning on and off allied participation munitions available runway uh reconstitution capabilities so we're, we're looking at all these things uh, across the AOR and uh, going to vary them in a big DOE right now. Okay, so we, we we ran that DOE, got 450 design points, and then threw this into uh, a regression and partition tree, uh, split those out where you're able to see what, what are your big drivers. So, for instance, in this one, uh, readiness makes it uh, the best basing thing you can do is put a carrier wing in Honduras. Um, and so these are kind of actionable insights that you might be able to get at. There's some interaction terms going on there that, you know, if I do these two things together, that makes a big, a bigger difference than just doing one at a time and kind of our, our best combinations there. But there's a lot of different ways to look at, look at your data there, but the, the goal at the end is to pull out actual insights uh, for the campaign. Next slide. Yeah, so this is just another one we've taken some of the top cases here and then looked at wh which ones did the best uh, within the campaign and what was what showed up most commonly so again you're seeing that carrier wing in honduras runway repair capability showed up well here putting AWACS in florida so di different options that you might be could be able to do to improve your effectiveness in the campaign and it's uh you're just pulling that out after looking at a, a really wide range of uh, of options Okay, and ne next slide, and I think I'm turning that over to, to Dr. Gallagher to uh, brief the rest. The slide progression seems to take a while. <laughs> So I'm not getting a progression on my screen. No, it seems to have uh, frozen over here too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I, that study was that Stephen just showed you was very much focused on all the different uh, 
kind of force structure changes we can make. There were some things here. I'm going to focus very much on strategy in this one. So in this one, we're going to keep all the uh, forces the same and just look at how strategy changes. So we got a very simple scenario here. Red land is going to try and take desired red land. We got some blue theater forces and desired red land. They're trying to defend it. Um, and we're going to look at the strategy. So I got some forces in here. We're going to hold all these forces constant um, in the, the study. So I'm not going to worry about it. I didn't list them all, but there's this example. So here's the scenario we set up. So red's main objective is to conquer that desired red land. They have 22 days to achieve that. And that 22 days is going to come become important. We divide that up into phase one of two days attacking the IADs. And then the second phase objective is attack the IADs and, and the attack air for three days. And then five days the bombardment to soften the troops. And then they're going to do conduct an invasion for 12 days. Blue strategy initially is going to be strictly defensive. So they're going to try and just hold this off. And we're always going to measure how well does red achieve their overall of conquering the land. So this is just an example of one of the outputs that we have from Beam. We, when we initially started Beam, we we're going to have lots of different outputs. We went to very simple and just we instead went to the CSV file so you could load it up and do your own. But what this one shows is by day, how well blue is getting all their objectives achieved. So you can see by the end of phase two, the blue has achieved about 65% of their objectives. Then from just that 65 becomes in phase two, becomes 100% of the next phase of taking those all down. So their conditional probabilities. And then, so if they've achieved everything in phase one, then how long has it taken to achieve their objectives in phase two and subsequently in phase three? So here's a chart going back to our base case again. So our base case was red was able to achieve desired red land 34% of the time. So you can see 76% in phase one, 64 in phase two, then 100 in phase three, and 70 in phase four. If you multiply those four phases together, you get the 37%. Our analyst did a large uh, design of experiments to look at all the different factors, and we found that two of them were very, very critical. One was the phase one of how far you drove down the IAD. So here we're taking it down to one squadron of IADs is functioning. And then in, in phase two, we took that further down to 0.5, and we took the, act, the attack air down to 1.5. Those so that first row shows you that's their baseline. And then red explored three COAs. Well, what if they change those thresholds of how far they're taking it down? What we find rather interesting is you see that if red actually leaves more uh, IADs available, so instead of taking it down to one, they take it down to 1.5 squadrons available. And then in phase two, only down to one. So they've left more IADs functioning. Uh, they actually do much better. They get 76% of the chance overall of conquering red land. And this is driven because they actually had they were spending too much time driving that objective low. That was taking them time and resources. So there's a sweet spot, and we found this repeatedly in looking at the military objectives, that the ends have a sweet spot of how far you want to take that down. The nice thing about Beam is it actually can show you that sweet spot where visually you can't see that. So now we took that red's best thing. So that's the first row here is just repeated from the previous slide. We said, what can blue do to counter this? So blue had been completely defensive. They've been trying to fed desired red land. Now they actually went on to, hey, we're going to attack red land itself. And they chose three different ways, attacking IADs, attacking attack air, and attacking both of them. What they come out to is there's 6%. And you go, well, why is it all the same? It actually is because none of those attacks did any actual damage. What they changed was we have adaptive adversaries on both sides. So red is going to change their objective or what they're doing so their missions here so we've broken out the missions on the right side you see the green and the black in between offensive and defensive so when blue was not doing any offense against red land they red was able to do almost everything in that top row it was green so they were all on the offensive just a few defensive missions but then when down in the second two rows, you see blue is now shifted at much more offensive missions and not only offensive but offensive against red land well, then you see that uh, red has got to respond by adding a whole bunch of defensive missions, and those defensive missions came at the expense of reducing their offensive missions. And that reduction is what dropped them overall to achieve here. What we're going to find is this is driven by the 22 days. So the next slide is actually going to drop off the 22 days and say, what if they can just go on for as long as they want? Well, clearly, if red can go on for as long as they want, to get 100%, you see in the upper left, of attacking all the forces. They're out, it's taken about 27 days is the best option there. The IAD threshold that works the best for them is 1.5 squadrons. And you can see red casualties and blue casualties. What the analysts noticed in this, and that's down on the lower side, red assets, they were losing all of their bombers and all of their fourth gen. So when they started phase three, they had no bombers. So in the strategy, it's labeled as ends, ways, means, and risks. They put in risk statements that say, hey, I don't wanna lose that many uh, fighters and bombers in my phase two, 
And that's what you see on the right side. So you actually see that they, they kept their, their bombers up and they kept their, their fourth gen aircraft up. And then they still lost most of the bombers. They lost all the bombers in phase four, but they didn't lose as many of the uh, uh, fighters. But then you see up in the, the highlighted line there for this COA, they reduced the I, they didn't do as much on the IATs, so that's 1.75 squadrons. They still get 100% completion, but it actually takes them less time, 25.7 days. The reds casualties actually went down in this, this strategy, and their blue casualties, what they inflict on the blue side, actually went up. So this is a much better strategy for red to do by adding in that risk. The next slide here is now we went back to blue side and said, well, how can blue counter this? So before blue went on the offense, so here we try and blue going on the offense again. What we found is this is just a much more robust strategy for red, so it's much harder. So the best that uh, blue could do is re reduce their chance of, of conquering desired red land by 5% here. It does take 29 days for, for red to do that, and red's casualties went up some, and blue would be able to reduce their casualties. But what we come out of this is the strategy matters a lot. The analogy I've used a lot of times is, hey, it's two chess players. They have the same order of battle, the same pieces. But if I have a chess master playing a chess novice, I'm going to bet on that chess master because strategy matters a lot. What I want our co-coms and our warfighters to be is to have a tool like Bean so they can figure out the strategies, balance the achievements, losses, and durations to be the chess masters and win the, win the next war. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. We finished two uh, applications demonstrations. Are there any questions before we start launching into how Beam is organized in the data? Yes, we did get a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, thanks for pausing there. Um, our first question from Jay folks, he says, is there an API or command line interface for these parametric exploration configurations? We are working on developing the API interface. So the API exists. Um, it's mostly a matter of documentation because the front end is talking to the API already. So yeah, once we get that well documented, People can hook up to an API. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Spike Has Beam been exercised to assess how the fight changes for Blue given varying mixes of subsonic, supersonic, hypersonic? Those can compare to other analysis approaches for consistency. So, this is Mark. I'll start the answer on that. Is right now is the uh, Air Force is actually engaged in two studies on using Beam, and so that'll be a first cut at it uh, in terms of how those missions, all those systems play out. As far as comparing to other ones, we're doing a, a different resolution. We have not done direct comparisons to other models. We It's got face validity that people in the field say that's the kind of results we'd expect, and that's similar to what we're getting in other models, but we actually haven't tried to, to link it down. It, it, I might, we have two challenges on that. Right now, we have unclassified performance data. That's one thing we're going to start fixing this next year because we have funding for. And the second is Beam adapts all the time. So it's really hard to make a direct comparison between another scenario to another model that's got scripted responses where Beam is constantly adapting. And I'll show you how that adaption is coming. Any more that's questions? Uh, we just got another one that came in uh, from Jeff. He says, does Beam have the ability to learn? Have you tried Beam versus Beam? So when we get to the methodology side, you're going to see that every day both sides are uh, adapting as best they can. They're actually optimizing their forces from their perspective. So in that sense, yes, we have not put a wrapper around or a search algorithm to do that. All of that potential is also there. We've, we've discussed it. We just haven't done it yet. Thank you. And I believe this came in as a comment, but I believe this is a question as well from Ryan. Uh, he states the ability to incorporate emerging technologies to systems and platforms and assess. Is that correct? So right now we can, uh, what happens when you put in a new system is you change the missions. So right now we can scale up missions, scale down, and we're within a month or two, we're gonna actually delay, a, put out a data, mon management, data management module, which is gonna allow you to make, hey, in this mission area, it's better, in this and that mission area, it's better, and actually incorporate new, new systems in there. So we're improving the, the capability there. But that's been asked for a lot, and then we're proceeding to do that. Perfect. Uh, and the last question we have before we uh, continue with the rest of the briefing from Richard says, how traceable are the results in terms of being able to understand why certain options are better? And how easy is it to explore excursions? 
So you can see clearly like the quantities of forces over time, and what's being, and you can detect the missions and what missions being attacked. Um, as I get into the methodology section, so hopefully you'll stay for that, is we'll, we're gonna actually show you how BEAM accounts for it. And we don't trace specific platforms through or specific ones, so you don't get a thread like that. But you can certainly look at the overall quantities of being available and what missions are being conducted while you're getting results. Thank you, that's all the questions we have right now. Super. So now we're going to continue on and start showing you how this works, which would get better than this question. So this first one is just what is the resolutional model? So the the x axis there is showing you the breadth. How much does a model carry? And then the upper axis is showing you resolution. That's the amount of detail you put in that. We're saying Beam is up at the Defense Enterprise, so it's got less resolution than a campaign model. Um, but it gets you these quicker insights, and because of that less resolution, we can search strategy. We're saying you shouldn't use Beam alone. It should find you a good spot to go run in a campaign model. So when we made this resolution, we set up some, some basic rules to do this. The so first is we have a common format for missions. So we're, we're gonna allocate all the forces, it's a joint model, but the way we present maritime, army, ground forces, or in space forces is all in the exact same format. The other rule we made is every time someone uses an asset, which is an asset is anything that contributes to getting their mission done, whether it's runway, munitions, um, fuel, whatever, um, that that becomes a potential target for the adversary. So you can't hide anything off there. And then finally, we have military strategy objects. We did stuff with the joint staff plan of ends, ways, means, and risks. So it's, 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 it's planners can be related to it and say, this is how we do it. We did say no lat long. So we're gonna use those geographic regions and say, that's where we have our strategy. And then we're gonna look at the forces within a geographic region. So we're not being specific if here's an individual force. And then the final one is looking at uncertainty. We do not use Monte Carlo here, but we capture uncertainty. But in one pass through the data, and I'll show you how at the end, we actually calculate all the distributions of all these outcomes. Most people want to just see the expected value, but you can actually get a confidence interval about all those. That's probably what makes Beam run fast. We get a Beam run on a laptop right now for a full-up scenario in about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and you can do lots of excursions. So a lot of times you run the, the whole 300 or so, whatever, overnight. So we had a multi-main representation. These are the four main parts that we divided into. So the regions, those are the maps where we make things up there. So one question I've asked is why are your regions different size? Because the army tends to make hex regions all the same. Well, we have a whole lot of stuff that's like out in the ocean that there's not a whole lot going on to. So we have forces out there, but we're gonna put out into a large region. And even on land, there's some force places like ports that are very critical of a small region where different objectives than the larger regions. So we use regions to track that and we actually put our forces in the regions. The forces are the assets over there on the right. So assets, anything that enables a mission outcome. And then we track those with a distribution. So we're gonna have a distribution for every asset per region and we're gonna track those distributions over time. Those we put together into missions and we're gonna show you missions. Missions are a collection of offensive capabilities, assets that are incurring uh, defensive capabilities, and then um, they, they have an impact at target. Any asset that's in a mission can have losses on that, and then that puts us to a military strategy. We can let, so look at the military objectives of how we're trying to achieve in the theater and ends, ways, and means, risk, and we have actually actual, which means that's what Blue thinks is actually doing, and we'll have what Red perceives Blue is doing, and we'll tell you, show you how that works out in the driving the assets to out, missions allocations. So now I'm gonna jump into military strategy. So there's something new that Beam brings to the defense community capability. So by phase, by region, we specify, here's the end, this is what we wanna do. So usually that's a, hey, I wanna take the adversary's target in this area down so far. I was showing you before, IADs being driven down to so many squadrons of IADs. The ways says, how do I wanna do that? So I'm gonna attack it with this particular type of munitions, such as long range fires or air missions. Uh, means specifies, I wanna use this specific platform to deliver that mission, or my means can actually say, exclude this, this asset from making that attack. And then risk says, for an overall particular uh, type of mission, I, I wanna limit the losses to that mission. So our offense of assets must be part of a mission they contribute to the objectives they achieve. So the strategy drives our mission, our assets to mission allocation in there, and it's the basis of assessment, because we're assessing how well we're doing by how we're driving down the adversary's assets. So the main thing here is most models want to go, their main modeling entity is the platform, like this is the aircraft, this is the plane. Our main modeling entity is the missions. So we're looking at these collections of missions and that's what we're selecting. And that's what's able to reduce the resolution. 
Here's an example to actually drive into this a little bit closer. So we have a achieve air superiority in the region. So our ways is we're going to attack the enemy's runways below a 0.7 threshold. The means is we're going to use fighter uh, friendly fighter forces to target the runways. And the risk we're going to say avoid the use of F-35s for that mission because we don't want to lose them below a certain point. This is just one example, but we can do ends here. We have one for getting major supply routes for ground combat, or it can be maritime superiority in the sea region. There's lots and lots of infinite number of options on ends. We are a completely multi-domain framework. So we've got space in here. In fact, space is probably more accurate than the others in that Space Force actually took the time and spent a year going through all their missions and making sure that space was adequately represented. We've got air, ground, and maritime in there. The next slides actually show for, here's an example of maritime. We show what the assets are in there, the type of regions they're gonna be put into, the missions they can do, how their strategies relate, and the dependencies on other domains. Um, I've got one of these on each, each of the, the fields. You'll, the slide deck's available. You can go through those and ask us questions later. I'm not gonna spend the time on, on going through all those. I do wanna say when Space Force got involved, they said, hey, your ISR is incomplete here. And they actually came up with this diagram of, hey, you start out with a, some targets are unknown, and then you can do ISR with your recon, you know the target's there, that's not enough to target it, so you can actually go back and target it, it better. Uh, and then once you target, you can actually go strike it, you may affect it or not. So we actually look at the decays and the flow through this whole thing for each particular type of target. We're adding in logistics now, so, uh, we're going to add in assets. We're looking at you know fuel munitions. We already had those. We already had moving things about being able to move things. But now we're going to start looking into repair and resupply and the regions and moving across from regions. This gets you back into what we bring in an asset. What do you want to do? So assets are just defined as anything that contributes to a mission. Give a bunch of examples there, like weapons numbers, munitions, faces. Um, Missions modify those outcomes by either consuming them or actually some there may be some offensive losses on those or they could be attacked and be destroyed. And that limited availability of assets is what drives the mission. You, hey, I can't do all these missions, so I have to pick, I'm going to pick the best missions I can. Um, every asset is a potential target for the other side, so you can't put something in high. Each asset, we look at what's the unit size we're going to measure it in. Usually we're doing like squadrons and brigades. Well, when we talk about fighters, it's actually a squadron of fighters. We look at the cost of those. We have them in groups, so you can say, I want to use air assets and we'll throw that. And we have the ISR probabilities of how much does the adversary know about them when you first put them there. So this can get into like preposition of forces. Do they know about them or not know about them? So here I'm going to take you into missions. So what you see is you have an offensive package. It can have several sub packages in it. What the sub packages do are make sure I allocate my forces in a reasonable manner together. So in the next example, I'm going to have uh, aircraft. I'm going to make sure I have a runway there. I'm going to have fuel there and munitions. I want those all to be, by, by the quantity I select, that they all go together. Those offensive packages are going to encounter de defensive packages, and then we're going to, they're going to impact the target. And, but the defensive packages are going to influence this a lot because that matters what the adversary all allocates to. So let's go to an example to talk through this. Here's our offensive package. So we're going to do a runway attack, and we're going to use 5th Gen fighters. So the primary is we're going to use uh, two squadrons of 5th Gen fighters. They're going to use two units of fuel, and they're going to have two sets of air to surface bombs, and they need 0.2 of a runway to do that. That's the primary. So with just the primary, that mission could be executed. But if you start adding in the secondaries on the offensive package, those secondary packages will actually make the mission more effective. So if I go to the right there, if I add in more 5th Gen fighters that are actually doing uh, counter air, so they've got air-to-air -air missiles there, that actually makes that overall mission getting to the target much more effective. Same as I can add in electronic warfare, I could add in AWACS or command and control aircraft. Down there I could have a tanker supporting them, or I could have a precision navigation and training, the timing, excuse me, precision navigation and timing satellite required makes it more effective. So all those secondary ones make it more effective. That offensive package is going to encounter a defensive package. So in this case, it's going to encounter an IAS with surface-to-air missiles. So there, the IAS has to be in there. They have to have surface-to-air missiles and encounter this. That's the basic mission. But then defensive can also add in secondary missions, which makes their defensive more effective and the offensive less effective. So here they're adding in fourth-gen fighters. Those are going to be some uh, defensive uh, air combat controls. And so they need fuel, they need air-to-air -air missions and runways, and that'll decrease red solar effect, and they can have a tanker actually supporting those. And then that'll affect the primary target. In this case, it's the runway, how many runways you have. So all these go together to make up different missions. Right now, we're close to a million different missions that BEAM is going to select from.
So this is good words that I just went through is we add in packages on the offensive side, they make it more effective. We add in defensive packages that decreases the offensive funds and the different combinations will lead to different missions. And then we do an asset to mission algorithm is gonna select those to optimize the mission. So this is an example uh, of, and it's a very small set of the, the example of how we actually do this. So um, what we're gonna have is we show three across the top, but you actually have uh, all the different assets go across the top that are involved in a mission. And then the down the, the, the column are the sub packages. So when we put in that fifth gen fighters right there, they, the fifth gen fighters don't cause any loss to fifth gen fighters and they don't cause directly any loss to the defensive fourth gen fighters. They're strictly going after the runway because they got air to surface bombs. So they're gonna, that one mission there, if we choose one of that sub package, it's gonna destroy on the first row, a half of the, the targeted runways. Now I can add in on the blue sub packages. So if I add in an escort fifth gen fighters, that's gonna improve my, in the first column, my offensive fifth gen fighter isn't gonna get lost as much because I got these defensive fighters. It's gonna hurt in the second column over the minus two says it's gonna destroy two units of the fourth gen fighters because it's there. And overall, it makes the mission more effective. So we're actually going to destroy more runways, minus 0.2 more runways, because we've added in the sub package of the fifth gen aircraft. So we can add in the electronic warfare, the AWACS, or the tanker support. All those make the mission more effective. On the flip side, then, they've got the defensive fourth gen fighters attacking this mission. If I add in a sub package of IADs into that, then that's actually gonna decrease. The minus one says, I'm gonna lose more of my fifth gen fighters because the IADS is gonna shoot more of them out. Um, it's actually gonna make my fourth gen fighters are more survivable because there's an IADS that's taking out a lot of the fighters and it's gonna decrease so more of the runways survive. So the 2.2 .2 is said more of the runways survive. So the defensive things have less impact on the target by making it more positive uh, and that. And then we get into a combination of this. And so the next slide starts showing you it takes you through words, what I just described of what each of these things contributes and how it, it works it out. And then when we get to here is now I'm showing you because we select it. So I've added in a, a far right column. Here's the number of allocated. So I'm gonna go through a linear program and we're assuming in this one, it shows three of the direct attack fighters, one of the escort fighters, two of the electronic warfare. And what we're taking is the dock product of those. So the three times the zero, and the one times the one and the two times the 0.5, and we sum those all up and we get from this combination of these numbers allocated, we're gonna lose uh, minus one unit of our fifth gen fighters, and but it's gonna take out minus 0.7 of the targeted runways. And this is the math that's gonna be done in phenomenal uh, many, many times in Beam to actually figure out what's the best allocation I should be. We're gonna optimize that with a, a, a linear program and it's gonna select those for each side given their perceptive. Stephen, do you wanna add anyone on this? This is kind of the heart of beam of the math here. Are there any questions we should answer? Yep. I'm handling some questions in the chat, but uh, I think you covered it well there. Okay, so we'll continue on then. So this gets into how we get the data for this. So we start out, what are the assets we have? We have to bundle those into packages. What the packages do are make sure I use them at the right level. So if I've got two aircraft, it's gonna need you know, four munitions per aircraft, and it's gonna need so much fuel, and it's gonna need so much runway. That's what a sub package is. It makes sure I use them in, in commensurate quantities. And then we put those all into two packages into missions, which gives us, here's the overall effect of that. When we actually execute the missions, when we plan them, we use the expected value of saying, here's the outcome. But when we actually execute it, we actually track, here's the outcome across all those missions, uh, the stochastic outcome that could come from that. Well, we build all this data from up from there, and this is what it takes to bring in new meta. Our current database is the JWAM, which the Center for Army Analysis has built as a unclassified adjudication for war games. We're now, this year, we're gonna start actually getting classified data in, into our effectiveness data from higher resolution models. With that, I'm now gonna start talking to you through the methodology. So um, as analysts, most of you wanna know how the model works. And so we've shown you the inputs and the outputs and kind of the results we get. Now I'm gonna start talking to you how we get to that. So this is a new approach to simulation. So we're gonna go one pass through the simulated time and we're gonna get a distribution of each of the outputs here. And what we're calling this is simulation thread. So each time period, we're gonna run a, a little uh, design of experiments uh, to make these threads, and then we're gonna evaluate all these threads. 
So the beam application simulation threads, it's a statistical distribution of all the assets, but we're going to choose a fixed point that's, that samples those. And we're going to start each sim simulated day with a whole new set of threads. And each thread is going to have a design point, which has a fixed quantity of the things. I'm going to show you in pictures how we're going to vary blue from low to high and re similar red. And each thread goal, I'm going to take you through the algorithms we're doing for that. So each simulating day, we have all these threads running. And then at the end of the day, we put all those threads back together. The Markov assumption I have there at the end says, I don't care how I got there. So if I show at day three, I've got 50 fighters. I may have had 75 the prior day. I may have had 100. I don't track that in beam. It's in the outputs, but I just show at this stage, this is what I'm tracking of where I'm at. So this is trying to give you a picture of this. So I'm going to start way over at the left. We've got simulation outputs, and we can run possibly the design of experiments. So that would be, hey, I want to have 50 fighters, 100 fighters, 10 tanks, 20 tanks, 300 ships, 600 ships. That would be an experiment. I put those all in, and we do that in almost every model. We run different experiments and where we change our inputs in terms of the outputs, and we look at the output of how those affect it. Now I'm going to jump into take one experiment, and I'm going to show two different ways of doing it. So the middle way is the traditional way. It says, hey, I'm going to generate different random number seeds, and I'm going to run the entire time period. I'm going to do a replication of the entire time period, and then I'm going to look across all my replications and analyze the results there. Beam cuts it the other way. We're going to take slices, and so I, I'm going to say I've got my, I start out with a fixed number, but then I, once I do a day, I've got an uncertainty. So I'm going to divide up that uncertainty in different bins, and those bins are each going to get a design point, and I'm going to make a thread on those. So I'm going to run all those threads one day. And at the end of that day, I'm going to look at all those outcomes and actually get a distribution for where I'm at. And then I'm going to go back to the next time strap and say, oh, OK, divide up all those threads again. So we're where the traditional mode goes from replications. That's from the beginning all the way to the end. and looks at the differences. We're going to do one day at a time and then put those together and get new distributions. So let me give you first. I'm going to show you that this works. I've tried some little problems. These are academic problems. So the first one is just adding numbers together. And you can see when I do random numbers, that's my squiggly line there. If I add them up, I get a, you know, sometimes it goes high, sometimes it goes low, and eventually comes up. The beam is right on track there in terms of the mean is what the first slide is showing. There was zero error there. That's because there's a symmetric distribution. We're doing a symmetric distribution. We can actually see on the estimating the variance that beam very rapidly converges on the variance. The second one down on the lower left, this is a gamma distribution, so it's not symmetric. It takes a few times before beam, a few bins, what beam is doing, number of threads. But as we increase the number of threads, beam rapidly converges up to the thing. The Monte Carlo bounces around that. Now, it's only one sample of the Monte Carlo, but it's hard to see it's that. And then in the same, the variance estimates out. But in beam, we're not actually tracking all the, all the combinations of the different bins here. And that's what I'm showing here on the left. We actually set up a little uh, reliability model. We Monte Carlo it, that's the green line. If I take all possible combinations of the bins, that's the blue line, so it's perfect. But we actually only do is a subset of them. And that what we see is that's the orange line. It induces a slight bias into the, into the results, but it's pretty small and it greatly speeds up the computations. So that was trying to give you some heuristics of the, the approach we're doing with simulation threads. Um, it's more of, it gets us good results. My little samples where I actually knew the theoretical answer and we're getting that. This is talking about why is the simulation thread be more effective. So if I'm doing random draws and I got a normal distribution, I'm going to get a whole lot of data points in the center. What Beam does, it saves that computational time because it just says in the center area, I got a higher probability, but I'll just do one sample and then multiply that. The same thing is that I'm doing random draws. I can get some very random guys out in the outliers and they can actually throw me off for a while. Beam puts out a large bin out there and says, hey, I'm not going to waste time on these low probability ones. I'm just going to test one that covers that area. Those two things make it converge rapidly, and it actually reduces computational time that's kind of wasted in a sense. But to do apply this beam approach, I need a set of recurring uh, reference points, so like fixed time intervals where I'm reevaluating this works really nice, and I have to make sure my state space does not expand, which is why I said I don't care how I got to 50 aircraft in this region. I just know that I'm at 50 aircraft is how we keep the state space from expanding. So now I'm going to try and do a picture of this to show you what we're doing inside of Beam. <laughs> so I'm going to have, uh, I'm over on the diagram on the right. I'm going to, just three assets. We actually, it's three assets per region, but um, we actually have hundreds of assets and we track them by every different region. But if you look at the first asset, the red one on the very top, I'm saying, hey, 
I've, I've got a uniform distribution. I think it could be low, it could be middle high, but it's all equal. So I divide those into equal quantiles. That's my four different colors of red there. And that's my first asset. My second asset is kind of a normal distribution, right? So what I do is my, my uh, tails are wider distributions to cover, to get an equal probability of 25%. And my ones towards the center are narrower and more probability is what we're showing there. And that's kind of normal. And then the third one down is I have an exponential distribution where it's, it's skewed off to the right. So again, we divide those up into equal quantiles. And that's for those three assets that I'm showing you, that's the quantiles we get. When we choose the low case, we're overall at the left on the pink side is we're choosing the midpoint of each of those quantiles for that's how many of that asset in a region we have. And we're going to divide those all up. All the way up to the dark red is when we choose the high side, we're going to choose the middle of all those probability quantiles to say that's how many fixed assets we have to start that thread. My pictures out to the, to the right now are, are blue, so I show three sample blue assets. Um, again, I did a reverse exponential on the, the first one, so it kind of increases over time. The second one is kind of a bimodal. It's got a, a significant chance of being low, not much chance of being in the middle, and then a chance to be up at the high. But we, we still divide those all into 25% probability bins. And the third one is kind of an erratic one that just comes out here. So now what we do to get our threads is we have all these quantile distributions before on red side and on blue side, and we take those cases, the dark, the, the color shows the cases, and we take the combinations of the red versus the blue, and we'll get for them. So the, the upper left square would show I've got red at all its low quantiles and blue at all its low quantiles. That would go all the way over. I go on the first row up to red being at their high quantiles and blue being at their low quantiles. If I go all the way down to the lower right, that's both red at their high quantiles and blue at their low quant, excuse me, blue at their high quantiles. And that's for every single asset in every single region. And that gives us 16 threads. We've actually done experiments where we try a number of threads. We find the results stabilized with about six bins per side. So there we actually get 36 threads. Okay, so this I'm now going to take you through. When you take all those combinations, you get a thread. This is going to talk through the algorithm by a single thread. So I'm going to start up in this green dot. That's where I come in with a fixed number by each thread. Well, depending on which side is, so we're going to have blue's perception and we're going to have red's perception. We, the algorithms mirror those, but they have different data in those. So blue, that blue line going from the, the beginning thread, so that's the truth model for that thread. Depending what blue has done for ISR and missions, they will get a perception of what they see for their forces and for red's forces. So on the, that's creating per, starting perception. So red has their perception of what the forces are out there. They will update red's strategy. So at the beginning, the analysts can actually say they know their adversary strategy or they have a perception of it and they may be wrong. Now, just like real warfare, if they have the wrong perception, they will look at what happens in their day. So their battle damage assessment, their BDA, and they will correct their perception. And that's what updating Red's perception says, well, what happened last time? Are they, you know, I didn't think they were gonna actually do a ground invasion, but I'm getting ground forces attacking. Well, then I'm gonna update that perception of what we're gonna do that. By the way, you don't have to play perceptions, you can give them the truth, but there is the option there to play perception. So once blue has a perception of what red strategy is, it now goes through that whole allocation process of from blue's point of view, here's what I'm going to do, here's what red might do. And they actually, we do fictitious play where we bounce that back and forth. We'll take the last solution from what blue is going to do and we'll say, well, what is red going to do? And then we'll take what red does and back and forth. We find about five rounds of fictitious play, stabilizes that, and that becomes from blue's perception what they plan to allocate forces to, to to best achieve their missions and their strategies. Jump over to the far right, red did the same thing. They went through, they estimated what blue strategy was gonna be. They allocated their forces. They did the fictitious play against their perception of, of, of blue's forces and what they have in forces. And then we get coming to the center of adjudication. Both sides come in and say, this is what I actually did. You know regardless of my, from based on what I plan, and that becomes the center one of adjudicate missions. We actually go through and say what missions actually occurred between blue and red, and then that becomes the mission outcome. It's our data retrieval. So we go into the big database, pull out the things, and this is where we actually track the probability of different losses. For every single, every single mission, it's gonna go through the probabilities of blues in different amounts there, and that becomes the mission outcome into this, the center of here's what actually happened. From that, we get an arrow going back to the blue side, 
that's the blue gets a perception of that. So how much ISR they've done and they've collected, they will in their comms, they will get a perception of here's the outcome of the battle right now. Red gets the same. We're going to stick on blue side now. Now, red is going to assess that. They have all these goals and objectives, so their ends. They go back and say, hey, did I achieve my ends? Have I driven my, the other's forces down to the level I want? If they have achieved all of their primary ends for a phase, then they've won that phase, and that data and the forces associated with it gets pulled off and held for the next phase to start. For all those that are unresolved, those get kicked back into the yellow bin there. They get reallocated into the, their, their, uh, the bins, so we get new bins, and then in the next simulated day, they start a new strategy. I'll stop there and say, are there any questions on the methodology? We've covered a lot here. Yes, there's been a <laughs> quite quite the effort in the chat. Uh, thanks, Steve, for addressing some of those. Um, really quickly, what I will like to do is just kind of point out a couple of those only because we do have a couple people dialed in via the phone who don't have access to the chat. Um, so the initial set of questions uh, was centered around uh, cybersecurity and EW. Um, so Spike said thoughts on inclusion of cyber domain and EW effects, and then Jake folks followed up and said, how are you quantifying the impact of EW assets? Do you use a uniform distribution or is that configurable? Uh, Steve, would you mind repeating your answer uh, verbally just for uh, everybody dialed in via the phone? I'm sorry, which one again? <laughs> uh, so this, this was there. questions about uh, cyber EW. Right, um, so uh, EW is a, a, or cyber are often a modifier on a mission. So when we're gonna allocate our forces, um, if, say you've got a airborne EW asset, uh, then, and you're gonna do some kind of airstrike, then including the EW would save the life of your guys and make you hit the target more often and so that becomes a a modifier on that mission and so we'd like to do that um, and so when it goes to allocate it would put the ew on it um, similarly uh, certain cyber effects can be the same um, again the cyber domain hasn't been that doesn't have nearly as much data as some of this other stuff but like we're not analyzing what is the frequency that we're jamming at um, what we're saying is okay this EW system versus these defensive systems uh, gives you over in general this much uh, change in your survivability or your ability to damage the target. And I say in general, it's a value with a distribution around it. And so, uh, so we do track the distribution there. Thank you. Uh, the following question that was also addressed in the chat uh, from Tom said, so if I had a new AA missile would I be able to adjust its missing success or weight uh, for the AA mission? Yes, I I did that last night for another study we're doing for the Air Force. So, uh, <laughs> absolutely, you can you can put in a new thing and say it's it's more effective, it's less effective. The point is that the uh, the mission blocks are I've got an extra AA missile, so if I'm able to allocate that, I haven't run out of that type of missile then I, I'm gonna have an improved performance within that mission. Thank you. Um, and a follow on question from Jay folks. So if you essentially, so if you essentially you parameterize EW as a function of RT where time is the unit of days and you have a parameter of agility, do you reweight the modifier in the educate in the adjudication stage? Uh, no, that's that's it's not it's not a function of region and time across the uh, across the OR. You actually have an asset. It's going to be engaged in a particular mission, and so you you allocate it every time step. Um, so that's yeah. We can have a more detailed discussion on that later. I think if uh, if you want to get some more details there. Yeah, I think we're all caught up with the questions. Thank you. Super. So, by the way, a lot of those questions are getting into the resolution. We are at a very high level. We are putting in mission data and then we're allocating by those missions or not. We're not getting into the lower level. This kind of gets to that. At the allocation level, we've got all the different assets. We've got all these distributions. We'll take a thread, we'll have a fixed point of those, and that allocates the missions to best achieve the overall ends. But that's given when I haven't read adversary's forces and the adversary's military strategy. And that's where we do the fictitious play from each side's perspective of what they think the adversary is going to do. 
after both sides have done their fictitious play and come up with their allocation, then we actually come up, this is the adjudication. We actually start looking at blue is allocated these assets, red is allocated these assets. You actually see some of blue assets will cause losses to blue things. They're gonna consume some of their forces and some of their forces will be lost in, in conducting the missions. And same, some of red's missions will be lost too. But that's where the adjudication actually comes through. And the adjudication actually takes the probability of those states being down. What's the chance I lose this many planes when they went on that, that sortie or this many tanks or this many ships, whatever we do. This is taking you back to trying to do a picture of the threads that are going on. So we start out the force structure with 25 aircraft and 30 tanks. After we go one day, we get a distribution here. We divide that distribution up here. We're only showing three threads. We actually run it with 36 threads often. Um, and so it's showing you the midpoints of those bins for those threads, 25, 30 tanks, 20, 26, 15, and 22 are the ones. Each one of those goes through that whole algorithm set that I wanted, what's the perception of forces, all those, how they allocate for each thread, which comes out with a distribution showing there in the outcome distributions of how that, that thread worked out. Then we put all those threads back together to say, here's our uncertainty, which gives us another distribution. And now we just repeat this process for the next day. So we're doing lots of calculations, but it goes fast. And that's how we're capturing uncertainty in one pass through the uh, data. I'm going to continue us on into uh, where we're at in this, this project. So the idea of this came up in, in 2013. What actually happened there is on the Air Force staff. And the we every year did a huge study on what force structure we had. But the planners and the budget guys were coming to us and saying, hey, we're out of money. Can we change our strategy? And our analysts were answering, hey, if you give me the exact strategy in six months, I can tell you where that strategy works. And I was like, we ought to be able to search the strategy. So that's where we started out with, hey, we need a different model. It's got different resolutions to get to this strategy. In 2019, uh, we actually got Lindquist came on board and that's when Steven Sturgeon joined the project and they took these big ideas and made them a reality of code that actually runs. Uh, 2020, we had a working, uh, working prototype delivered. Um, we started to, to distributing that in uh, 2022. In 2023, right now, we're at version 4.23. So our second release, we have a joint scenario. We got unclassified data. We have CUI data. We're now moving into classified data this year. We have a scenario that's actually classified. So the performance data in the scenario is unclassified right now, but all the objectives and how we lay it out is classified. We have a wargaming motion, uh, version where you can actually stop it in a day and say, well, what if I change my strategy? How does this go? We were in June 13th, we were cleared to have this run on the networks, which was a big step for us. Still having trouble getting people to accept that clearance and get it on, but we're working to get it on the government networks. Uh, and it's been used in a major study last year. I'm going to show you in a minute that we've got several studies coming up here. The war gaming motion. So a lot of people said, well, we don't do analysis in this area. It's out at the war gamers. And we go talk to the war gamers like, well, we don't use models. We're actually getting into this where it can support the war game, at least setting up, make sure they have a good war game. We've made a version that stops each day and you can change your strategy. Beam still allocates the forces to meet that strategy. Um, this is what it takes to do this. So we have the fundamental tasks. Those just have to be done every single year. I've got to keep that and that, and that's what keeps me my, my, that's my baseline. I got to do that done. In 2024, we're going to add a second theater scenario. So right now we got one actual classified scenario for one theater. We're going to add one for another theater. We've been funded to add in logistics and repair. We already have the algorithms for that, but we're going to actually collect all the data for that. We're actually going to get classified a perfectness data, at least start it and figure out the models, what, what's the high resolution model do to. So that's all been funded for 2024. We also have several studies in started. So one service is going to conduct their uh, force design study with Beam, and that same service is actually going to say, "What if we went way out into the future? How would our, our forces look?" And then another service is developing war game scenario with Beam. So they're trying out what would they would have played the war game. They're trying that out in Beam and saying, "Oh, that doesn't work as well as you want to set it up." And I do want to thank my sponsors here: so Air Force Research Lab. Uh, Strategic Development and Planning and Execution Office, Experimentation Office, excuse me, has funded us mostly, and that's where our contract is out of. The SPOC, which is Space Operational Center, S9A, has also been contributing funding and actually went through and made sure all the space stuff is good. And then just recently is Air Force Futures, which is Air A57, has stepped in with a big way of saying we're going to do a force design here. So we're moving towards an open ended uh, product here that we can deliver for. We know you asked a lot about questions. We got a little bit of cyber in there. We can, as long as it's cyber, we can put in those same mission categories, we can do it. We know we want a search of the, the uh, 
strategy space. Some people are talking about AI that we want to search the strategy space. We want to search the force structure space. We, we do have training videos that come with the software that give you a good way of here's how to do it, but we actually want to improve those, improve the user interface. We want to get to production software. That means, hey, if I have a different algorithm I want to try out in here, how if I do the allocations differently? We need production software so all that code is documented and you know what the interfaces are to that. And we'd like to do a thread study to actually show the math of here's what we're trying to do and make sure that's all right. And we're ever set up to support war games. We have not had anyone ask us to do war games yet, but I expect that's coming soon because there's been lots of questions about war game. They want some support for war game and they actually want some desired inputs. So with my last slide here, we, we've developed the capability for quick assessing and analysis. It doesn't replace any model because it's less resolution than any model. So we're not competing with campaign models. We're saying this will search the space and then go run your campaign model with the results of being. Um, and then we have, it's proven out in a study that it's given results that people find useful. The government has chosen to make this at no cost. So the DOD goal is to make this community accepted. And so we're, we've cleared it for Five Eyes, NATO, we're giving it to FFDRCs and DOD contractors can all have the model. So if you send me an email, which is coming up, we'll give you a user's agreement. You just sign the user's agreement, we'll send you the model. Um, we have people evaluating across all across the DOD. So every service has got it. We've got foreign partners that are looking at it. We have uh, FFRDCs, so our fully funded research and development corporations are looking at it and, and numerous contractors. Uh, NATO has tentatively put it on their next gen MNS architecture, and then war gamers are considering it, but they haven't come forward to use it. Um, I do tell people it does take more to keep this going, so that's what we're looking here for thing. We have these additions being added this year, our uh, additional scenario logistics and classified performance, and we intend to enhance the, the model as it goes on, and we're going to mature it to a prototype, to a production software that we can live for everyone else. With that, that concludes my briefing. Um, we're open for any questions if we'd like. Uh, Steve and Mark, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great webinar. Uh, we could tell just by the questions as well as uh, the activity in the chat uh, that we had an engaged audience. Um, I would like to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, we did have some questions from the administrative side about where they can get the slides. Uh, the slides is posted to today's webinar announcement. Uh, that link is in the chat. Um, at the bottom, it'll say view, view the PDF, um, and you can download the slides. Uh, this webinar also is being recorded. <clears throat> it will be uploaded to the CSI YouTube page as well as to today's webinar announcement, which will take you to the YouTube page uh, within a couple of days. Um, this was a great conversation. I, I appreciate the, the conversation specifically about cyber effects and EW models as that's a question that we always get uh, related to modeling and simulation here uh, at the IX. Um, we do have our next webinar next month, uh, which is CY, so we'll be limited to uh, the US government and their contractors, but related to AFSIM and their space capabilities, uh, some are related to today's conversation. So um, Mark and Steve was gracious enough to provide their contact information. Please feel to reach back out to them, or you can uh, submit your questions to CSI and we'll get you in contact with the presenters as well. Uh, but thank you very much. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. It's great.